This video is sponsored by Magellan TV. Welcome back to Launchpad. I'm Christian Reddy, your friendly neighborhood astronomer. In our last video on future space telescopes, a number of you commented wanting to know why we don't just put telescopes on the moon instead of in space. Well, it's a fair question, and one that's been asked even before the Apollo program. But now that NASA has a mandate to return astronauts to the moon under the Artemis program, the question of lunar observatories has begun to return to the astronomical community. Now there are some obvious advantages to having a telescope on the moon, not the least of which is having a stable surface to anchor a telescope, and the moon's far side makes for the perfect location for some types of radio astronomy. In fact, there are some really interesting radio telescope proposals for the moon's far side that I'm going to get into toward the end of this video, so make sure you stick around. However, it is hard to overstate just how difficult it is to get to the moon, and how unforgiving the lunar environment is. In fact, I was reminded of this the other day when I watched Moonshots inside the Lost Apollo archives on Magellan TV, who by the way are very kindly sponsoring today's video. Moonshots summarizes NASA's Apollo lunar program from Apollo 1 to 17. The Apollo missions are, to this day, some of the greatest feats of human exploration ever accomplished. The documentary features rare archival footage and returns to moments when astronauts were put in real jeopardy as they explored the moon. And it's available on Magellan TV. Magellan TV is a new type of documentary streaming membership that was created by filmmakers. Their team of producers and curators bring together premium content which dives deep into topics such as history, art, nature, and of course my favorites, space and science. New programs are added on a weekly basis and can be watched anytime on your Amazon Fire TV, Roku, Apple TV, Google Play, and iOS. You can even cast directly from your phone to your TV. Documentaries are streamed without interruptions, ads, or limitations on access. Even better, you can enjoy a wide selection of programs in beautiful 4K at no additional cost. If you enjoy the content here on Launchpad Astronomy, then you'll enjoy Magellan TV. And that's why I'm delighted to tell you about an exclusive offer just for my viewers. By signing up at the link on your screen, you'll get an extra month of Magellan TV absolutely free. Please make sure to use the link in the description of this video. The idea of a telescope on the moon isn't new. German astronomers Wilhelm Beer and Johann Heinrich von Madler drew the first accurate maps of the moon between 1834 and 1836. They realized that the moon's lack of an atmosphere would allow for a pristine view of the sky and would be the ideal location for a telescope. With the Apollo program more than a century later, the idea of a telescope on the moon finally became a reality. An ultraviolet telescope designed by George Carruthers of the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory flew on Apollo 16 in 1972. To block the sun's glare, astronauts John Young and Charles Duke set up the telescope in the shadow of the lunar module. During the mission, they would return to point the telescope at another target on Carruthers' list. At the end of the mission, the astronauts removed the film cartridge and left the telescope behind. The roll of film contained just 178 frames. It wasn't much, but it was enough for Carruthers to confirm the existence of interstellar molecular hydrogen and reveal the first ever ultraviolet images of the solar wind, galaxy clusters, and aurorae in Earth's ionosphere. Carruthers' telescope was a proof of concept designed to demonstrate the capabilities of a telescope on the moon. But the moon wouldn't host another observatory until 2013, when China landed another ultraviolet telescope aboard its Chang'e 3 lander. The Lunar Ultraviolet Telescope, or LUT, was only 15 centimeters in diameter, but it operated for 18 months and collected thousands of hours worth of data. So why was there a 41-year gap between lunar telescopes, and why weren't there any others in the intervening years? After all, it takes the Moon about a month to make one rotation around Earth. Thanks to tidal locking, it keeps the same side facing Earth the whole time. That means a telescope on the Moon would experience roughly two weeks of daylight, followed by two weeks of darkness. Since the Moon lacks an atmosphere, stars can still be imaged in the daytime as long as the telescope doesn't point too close to the Sun. Sounds good, right? Well, there are a couple of problems. A telescope on the near side of the Moon would have the Earth in its sky 100% of the time. That's a good thing, because it allows for continuous communications back and forth. But Earth reflects a lot more sunlight to the Moon than the other way around. 
In fact, the full Earth as seen from the Moon is 50 times brighter than the full Moon as seen from Earth. That's going to be much too bright for astronomical observations, so a near-side telescope would have to have a permanent exclusion zone for Earth and an additional exclusion zone for the Sun during lunar daytime. A telescope on the Moon's far side avoids the problem of having an Earth occupying the sky, but it also means that no direct communications would be possible either. Some additional mechanism would be required, such as a lunar orbiter or a direct link to an antenna on the Moon's near side. But that would require a very long cable, at least several hundred if not thousands of kilometers in length. No matter which side of the Moon the telescope is placed, it would have to be insulated against extreme temperature swings between day and night. Daytime temperatures reach 127 degrees Celsius. When the sun goes down 10 to 14 days later, the temperature plummets to minus 173 degrees Celsius. Earth's atmosphere does a good job of redistributing heat around the planet. This minimizes the difference between day and night temperatures and also slows down the transition. This helps to ease the thermal stresses on telescope mirrors and support structures. But lacking an atmosphere, the day-night temperature changes on the Moon are virtually instantaneous. That would permanently deform an ordinary telescope mirror and render it completely useless. This is why space telescopes are protected by a surrounding enclosure or sunshade. A thermal shield on the Moon would have to withstand these extreme temperature changes on a regular basis. There's another problem for telescopes on the Moon that telescopes in space never have to deal with, and that's Moon dust. During the Apollo missions, astronauts and their equipment were covered in the stuff. Moon dust is formed by micrometeorite impacts which pulverize local rocks into fine particles. The energy from these collisions melts the dirt into a vapor that condenses on soil particles. As the vapor cools, it crystallizes on the soil, turning the dust particles into tiny shards of glass. It gets worse. Ultraviolet rays from the sun strip electrons out of the dust, giving the dust an electric charge. The electrically charged particles repel each other and billow up into fine clouds in the low lunar gravity. This makes the lunar dust cling statically to any surface it comes in contact with. During Apollo 17, for example, Jack Schmidt and Gene Cernan reported being unable to move their arms and legs because the dust had worked their way into the joints of their spacesuits. 41 years later, that same lunar dust would kill Chang'e 3's rover, U2. But the biggest challenge to putting a telescope on the Moon is putting it on the Moon. Not only does all that mass have to be launched from Earth, it has to land safely on the Moon. That means launching a landing vehicle along with the telescope. It's no wonder, then, why it's easier to launch a telescope into space and operate it there. In the coming decades, it will be possible to send large telescopes to the Sun-Earth L2 point, where the telescope can shield itself from the Sun, Earth, and Moon with a single sunshade, all while keeping a line-of-sight communication to Earth. Oh yeah, and there's no lunar surface blocking the telescope's view either. But sure, there's still the matter of actually having to point the telescope once in space. And this is done with either thrusters, reaction wheels, or a combination of both. But thrusters run out of fuel and reaction wheels eventually break, which brings us back to the Moon. With the surface to push against, operating the telescope becomes much easier. But what about all that dust? And what about all of that mass to land? Well, what if there was a way to use that dust to help build the telescope and reduce its launch mass? In 2008, Peter Chen, then at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, demonstrated a simple recipe for making a mirror out of moon dust, carbon nanotubes, and epoxy. The moon dust was crushed earth rocks that NASA uses to simulate the lunar environment. They poured the mixture into a 30 centimeter rotating disk. As the disk spun, the mixture formed into a parabola, which is the shape needed for a telescope mirror. As more epoxy was added to the mixture, the disk hardened into shape and was coated with aluminum. The result is a moon dust mirror. Chen estimated that a Hubble-sized mirror could be manufactured with 600 kilograms of moon dust, 60 kilograms of epoxy, 6 kilograms of carbon nanotubes, and less than a gram of aluminum. However, telescope mirrors need to be polished to an accuracy less than the wavelength of light itself. This requires sophisticated polishing machines that grind away at a mirror for months at a time. So on the one hand, you wouldn't have to launch any moon dust. 
But on the other hand, you'd still have to launch the rest of the telescope along with a mirror lab that could fabricate the mirror and install it when ready. However, a liquid mirror makes forming a telescope as easy as spinning a pan. A reflective liquid such as mercury is poured into a cylinder which is then spun up. Gravity and the centripetal force acting on the fluid forms it into a parabola. Boom! Instant telescope mirror, no polishing required. However, such a mirror could only point straight up to the zenith. Tilting it would change the mirror shape and render it useless. The largest liquid mirror telescope ever built was the Large Zenith Telescope at the University of British Columbia. LZT used a 6 meter liquid mercury mirror until it was decommissioned in 2019. Mercury would be useless on the moon. Not only is it very dense and heavy to launch, but it would evaporate quickly when exposed to the lunar vacuum. But ionic fluids, which are essentially molten salts, don't evaporate in a vacuum and can remain liquid at very low temperatures. Ionic fluids aren't reflective in and of themselves, but coating it with 50 to 100 nanometers of silver turns it into a telescope mirror. In fact, the silver is so thin it actually solidifies. In the vacuum of space, a silver-coated liquid mirror would neither evaporate or tarnish. Liquid mirror telescopes can only look straight up, but then again, that means there wouldn't be any need for heavy mounts or pointing mechanisms. That would dramatically simplify the construction and reduce its launch mass. The moon's low gravity offers two major advantages for liquid mirrors. First, the mirror can spin slower than it would need to on Earth. And second, the lower gravity would permit much larger mirrors to be made, even up to, say, 100 meters. Imagine if the overwhelmingly large telescope could be built on the moon. A liquid mirror telescope could also be established in one of the many craters near the moon's poles. There it would remain in permanent shadow at the bottom of the crater. The telescope would reach cryogenic temperatures without the need for complex sunshades. Solar panels mounted around the crater could generate the necessary power to keep the mirror spinning. Such a telescope would be ideal for cosmology, which doesn't require any specific pointing. But even then, the telescope wouldn't always have to look at the same spot in the sky. As long as the telescope isn't mounted exactly at the moon's rotational pole, its orbit around Earth would allow the telescope to scan a ring around the sky every month. And the moon's orbit precesses every 18.6 years. That would allow the telescope to scan an even wider swath of the sky. In principle, the moon offers several advantages for astronomy, but in practice it's many disadvantages of kept telescopes on Earth or in space. But commercial heavy launch vehicles like SpaceX's Starship and Blue Origin's New Glenn will lower the cost of launch, and NASA just awarded contracts for commercial lunar landers as part of the Artemis program. But we already know how to launch and operate telescopes in space, so it's no surprise that the proposed observatories for the 2020 Decadal Survey are all space-based. However, there is one kind of astronomy that can only be done on the Moon's far side. In fact, there's nowhere else in the inner solar system to do it. Ultra-long radio waves are distorted and blocked by Earth's ionosphere. That means detecting the universe at these wavelengths must be done in space. But Earth is also the loudest radio source in the entire solar system. There's no radio shade a spacecraft can carry to keep Earth's signals from overwhelming a telescope. However, a radio telescope on the Moon's far side is shielded by the Moon itself. This makes the Moon's far side the only location in the solar system where ultra-low frequency radio astronomy is possible. In fact, there is a proposal to create the far side array for radio science investigations of the dark age and exoplanets, or simply far side. To understand the benefits of such a radio telescope, let's talk about a unique science case. 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe was an ocean of hydrogen and dark matter. The only radiation was the weak 21 centimeter emission occasionally radiated from hydrogen. But thanks to the expansion of the universe, this already long wavelength emission has been stretched to ultra long wavelengths that cannot be detected from Earth. To detect this primordial emission, Farside proposes an array of 128 antenna nodes deployed across a 10 square kilometer area. The array is folded up onto a commercial lander such as Blue Origin's Blue Moon. A rover would unfurl the antenna and trace out a four-petal array 
that is connected to the lander, which handles the central processing. The lander would then be able to communicate with Earth via the Lunar Gateway or another spacecraft. The lander would be powered by a pair of enhanced multi-mission radioisotope thermoelectric generators, allowing a mission lifetime of about five years. The rover would be solar powered and be able to deploy one pedal over a single 10 to 14 day sunlight period. Then the rover would hibernate for the lunar night and deploy the next pedal over the next daylight cycle. After four months, the entire array would be deployed and Farside would be ready to begin its science mission. By the way, not only would Farside be shielded from Earth's radio noise, but also from radio discharge from Earth's aurorae and noise from plasma in the solar wind. Once deployed, Farside would be able to study the universe's dark ages and allow astronomers to understand how hydrogen flowed with dark matter to create the universe's first stars. It would also be able to monitor coronal mass ejections from nearby stars and even detect the magnetospheres for the nearest habitable exoplanets. Farside could characterize similar phenomena right here in our solar system by monitoring the magnetospheres of outer planets. In fact, it could even detect the magnetosphere of the hypothetical Planet 9, should it exist. An even more ambitious concept to understudy is the Lunar Crater Radio Telescope, or LSIRT. LSIRT works by landing a lander containing the telescope's hardware at the bottom of a 3 to 5 kilometer diameter crater. Another lander delivers several duaxle rovers which surround the crater. Duaxle is a new technology that's under development by NASA's JPL and Caltech University to allow rovers to navigate the steep terrain of Martian craters. The rovers maneuver into position around the craters and anchor themselves into the soil. The rear axles detach on a tether. The rear axles descend the crater wall until they reach the lander and retrieve guide wires leading out from the lander. They simultaneously ascend the crater wall and as they do so, they suspend the receiver and link it to the waiting rovers. Then the axles return to the lander and retrieve the telescope mesh. They'd coordinate their movement and lift the mesh to form the telescope's receiver. With the mesh anchored to the surrounding terrain, the axles return to their host rovers. The two axles can now coordinate with each other to adjust the receiver's position. The result is a telescope that operates very much like the Arecibo Radio Observatory in Puerto Rico and China's 500-meter fast telescope. The idea is still in its early stages, but as currently envisioned, LSIRT would produce a one kilometer diameter telescope. This would make LSIRT the largest single aperture telescope, not in the world, but in the entire solar system. The moon's far side is the only place in the solar system that sits in the permanent radio shadow of Earth. However, the same exploration and expansion of the moon that would make this kind of radio astronomy possible could also just as easily ruin it. As more infrastructure is added to the moon, radio interference will build up as well. If the radio quiet environment of the moon's far side isn't preserved, then long wavelength radio astronomy won't be possible from anywhere in the inner solar system. Still, the future of astronomy in space is on the whole very promising. And that's why I made a video about four new space telescopes NASA wants to build. These telescopes would come after the James Webb and Nancy Roman telescopes, which are set to launch this decade. There's some really cool stuff in this video, so if you haven't seen it yet, head over there when we're done here. I also like to thank my patrons for supporting Launchpad Astronomy, and I want to welcome my newest supporters, Gregory Bologna, Richard Goodall, Stephen M. Pale, and a special welcome to my first ever intergalactic patron, Anna. Thank you all for your support, and especially to Michael Dowling and Stephen J. Morgan for their cosmological level support. If you'd like to help support Launchpad for the price of a cup of coffee every month, please check out my Patreon page. And if you'd like to join me on this journey through this incredible universe of ours, well, please make sure that you subscribe and ring that notification bell so that you don't miss out on any new videos. Until next time, stay home, stay healthy, and stay curious, my friends.